can prepare <coughs> to make their transition so that their descendants can access them. Wow. To help them. Mm -hmm. Help Cole, uh, Cole and Wayne, Harriet, uh, I mean, Claudette. Claudette. Brothers and sisters, we have really a fantastic opportunity to hear a man who is full of wisdom, full of spirit, has spent a lot of time on the continent and all of the sacred places where our history is recorded and hidden and has had an opportunity to research both sides of the ledger from the European uh, archives uh, and their sacred places to our own sacred places and been in touch with uh, spirits of our ancestors and also the spirits of those who have captured us. And so many on both sides have spoken to this brother and he has listened with attentive ears. And now we ask the Creator to let his lips speak mm. and let him tell us some of what he has heard. I give you Dr. I, I always pronounce Isa. Jahi Isa. Jahi Isa from the University of Delaware. Um, I was previously at Delaware State University. Delaware State University. Right. So well, I'm, um, I'm over there. Tell us a little bit about yourself right, and um, how you came to be who you are. All right. Um, I was born and reared in um, St. Louis, Missouri, um, in an area called Kenlock, Missouri, which is the epic center of Ferguson. Um, Ferguson is, 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 is a part of St. Louis County. It's not some distant land away from St. Louis. It's literally, Dred Scott is buried in Ferguson. And um, um, so that history and that culture, Scott Joplin, is buried in St. Louis. And I recall as a child listening to a lot of Scott Joplin's music uh, because people took pride in that that uh, form of music that he created. So um, that's where I'm from. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I grew up in a, um, a nationalist family on my mother's side. Um, they were either pastors or in the nation of Islam. So that is what um, had a large, uh, serious influence on me in my life and wanting to be a historian. Um, I knew that since the age of uh, five, I mean, age of 10. And um, and then following the works of Dr. Van and Dr. Clark and Van Sertema, that's who I wanted to be like growing up. I wanted mm. to be like them. Yeah, you, you were saying that Dr. Clark, Dr. Van? Right, I wanted to be like them, you know, when I first met Dr. Clark in the, in the 80s uh, while I was in high school. Um, that's what I wanted to be like. And I was already, always interested in history, but having met him and then going off to um, college in Louisiana and uh, meeting them in person, Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark, and uh, meeting Amos Wilson, uh, I wanted to mirror my life after them. And so, uh, yeah, that's my influences outside of also being a part of the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church of the Shrines of the Black Madonna, which was founded by um, Jeremiah Baby Ajaman, um, otherwise known as Albert B. Clegg. Um, I was highly influenced and that shaped a lot of my, my um, 20s thinkings when I was in my 20s. And um, then I went, I, I did my bachelor's degree at Texas Southern, but I started off at Southern University in Louisiana, transferred to Texas Southern after I heard one of the shrines of the Black Madonna ministers came and did the invocation at Southern University and uh, said that every black person should read Chancellor Williams' uh, Destruction of the Black Civilization. And then the president of the university, Ms. Dolores Spikes, said that also it made it mandatory that every freshman read the, 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 the uh, Destruction of Black Civilization by Chancellor Williams. And I was in the Shrines of the Black Madonna for four years. I went to seminary at Emory, started traveling to Africa, started in Egypt, and then made um, numerous of trips to uh, 
West and North and Central Africa. Mm -hmm. And um, um, that's shaped a lot of who I am today and my, my beliefs. Mm -hmm. But while I was at Howard University, um, well, when I was at Southern doing my master's degree, um, I decided to do research on the Garvey movement in Louisiana. And I found some documents after reading Tony Martin's book, uh, Race First. Uh, we invited him to come down and speak. And um, I noticed that Louisiana had more Garveyite branches than any other region in the world. And I wanted to know why. And uh, I, my master's thesis was on the Garvey movement in, in New Orleans. And then I entered Howard University to study under one of the top Garvey scholars in the country, Emory, Emory Tober. And he edited the first four volumes of the Garvey papers, which are volumes that are 16 volumes, and they're about a thousand pages each. Mm -hmm. And he was the first senior editor of the first four volumes, so I studied under him. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the Garvey movement um, in Louisiana, which is now a finished manuscript, which hopefully will be published this year. Oh, very. Can you talk to us a bit about Garvey? But before we enter Garvey, let's, let's do a backdrop <clears throat> and lead up to Garvey. Let's, sure. let's begin this backdrop, uh, 1865, and look at what uh, African Americans, Africans in America, um, uh, at the time of emancipation and so forth, what were, what were they doing? How well, would you I, I think we would have to go back <laughs> because you, you, you have to, you know, the person I studied under at Howard University, he's considered the father of the African diaspora, Joseph E. Harris. And he wrote a book called Africans and Their Histories. But he would all, he developed this concept called the African uh, diaspora. Ho, ho, I'll bring you up. No problem. We were saying that in order to look at African history right after emancipation, of right. course we have to go back and look at what Africans were doing before emancipation, exactly. it's very so important. that we would get a very good look at who, what was happening to us and what we were doing to yes. maintain our dignity and our humanity and to find our freedom. Right. Well, the, the, the background to black political thought and action in this country owes everything to African nationalism. Black people who came to this country, African people, who came to this country, came here culturally and sovereignly equipped. They came from sovereign kingdoms. Uh, those Africans who were shipped into Louisiana, Georgia, South Carolina, um, for instance, South Carolina, just for historical references, um, Malcolm X's paternal great-great-great-grandfather was Bambara, from the Senegalese area, right? So this, this is how far we are from slavery, right? But our history didn't begin in slavery. So these people came from very powerful uh, regions, and that area was heavily dominated by the Songhai Empire, right? And this is one of Africa's greatest empires, Somali, um, Ghana, Song, Mali, and Songhai. And they had a, a serious educational system where many of them could read. And many of our ancestors who, who, who were brought here could read and write in other languages, and including their own indigenous language. And even wrote here, wrote histories of their own people of, and their sovereignty and what they were doing in that respect in Africa. So these are people who came here. These was not, so our history did not start in slavery like a lot of the Muslim pictures like to tell us, uh, 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 have us to believe. We came here with a sovereign mindset. We came here from sovereign kingdoms. We came here directly linked from African kingdoms in which we ourselves, many of us, within our bloodlines are still related to African royalty. This is in our bloodline and there's mm -hmm. nothing you can take away. So this prompted our political thought and the resistance movement. These, even if we start with the pre-colonial era, era um, before America became an independent state in 1776. In fact, the American Revolution 
was really a counter-revolution to the African revolution that was being waged here, where these African nations throughout the American colonies were engaged in armed liberation struggles to free themselves to either set up first to try to get back to the African kingdoms that they were forcibly taken away from, and secondly, are to set up African empires here like what happened in Haiti, like what happened in Palmares in Brazil, and like what happened in what is now, what was then considered Dutch Guyana, which is now Suriname, where those Africans there have maintained more than 400 years of independent African states to this day. Mm -hmm. So we were doing that here. So we came, we had a sovereign consciousness. So what we see now related to Black Lives Matter, which comes out of the Black Liberation Movement, which comes out of the civil rights movement, then progressed to black, again, back to black political independence. That's what the black power movement was always about. But that has been the core of our history. So if we look at the American Revolution, again, it was a, it was a counter to the African Revolution where African peoples took up arms for their freedom all throughout the country from um, from the colonial period up until the end of the Civil War, there were more than 300 recorded African liberation movements. People called them revolts. Mm -hmm. They were not revolts because we were not citizens, and only a citizen can revolt. No, mm -hmm. what they were were armed resistant movements or armed liberation movements to, again, go back to Africa or to set up African kingdoms in the United States, in which some of us did. The, um, the one prime example was what was happening um, with the Seminole indigenous people and the Africans, and they held that down for more than 100 years, um, an African independent kingdom in which they, 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 they merged with the indigenous people here. And so that is our history, that is more of our history than the integrationalist civil rights Movement. So when we look at the backdrop of what people call Garveyism, um, this stuff was going on before Garvey arrived. Do, we, can I can I ask you to uh, expand a little bit on the resistance movement, uh, especially the uh, Seminole, uh, and and connect that to uh, to what is going on uh, in places like uh, uh, Florida today and why there is uh, so much resistance and at the same time outright murder of African people in well, places like Florida, because Florida would have, would go all the way back to the Seminole. Right. Um, well, the, 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 in 2014, a very, a watershed study came out by one of the country's leading scholars, Gerald Horn. He's a full professor of history at the University of History. Um, University of Houston, he's written over 30 books, and all of them are primary sources. Many of them uh, are archival records, so there's this heavy stuff and the heavy work that he's done. Um, but he wrote a book called The Counter-Revolution of the American Revolution of 1776, and where he's documenting um, numerous of, of, of white plantation owners' records or how they're saying that the Africans are going to take over the country and how these Africans made numerous attempts to take over the country, whether it was during the colonial period where they did and they united in, in, in the 15th century, with, which led to Bacon's Rebellion, which was a, a unification war between Africans, uh, indigenous people, and poor Europeans who were brought over and enslaved. Uh, or whether it was the Stono Rebellion, which took place in North Carolina, where Africans were the majority, and they set up temporarily an independent African state. Or we can go, and many of them, after the Stono Rebellion, at the um, um, request of the indigenous kings in Florida, or what the people call Native Americans, they moved there to Florida and set up the Seminole um, kingdoms there, where they fought the the British, the British, the Spanish, and the American colonist settlers uh, for more than a hundred years until they were finally conquered under um, um, Jackson. 
mm -hmm. uh, Jacksonian, <laughs> and, and moved and forced to move west. Uh, and so these resistance movements, um, like I said, there were more than 300 of them that were recorded. We don't know. There could have been a thousand of them, but there were 300 of them recorded. And they were not just uh, uh, um, uh, movements because they were angry. No, they were well planned out. Mm -hmm. And many of them were very close to taking over the seating powers where they existed. The largest mm -hmm. one was in Louisiana in mm -hmm. 1811. And they, they had trained for numerous of years. And um, they, they were very close to overthrowing the colonial government, the French colonial government of Louisiana. And um, so this is the history prior to the emancipation. This is what it was about. And um, some have even um, said that right on the eve of the Civil War, there were more than 100,000 African troops um, all vetting to right before the Civil War. They were about to march on Washington, D.C. And this mm. is before the Civil War. 100,000 African men who were trained. They were trained in the mountains all surrounded around uh, 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 um, D.C. And so America almost became a Haiti on numerous of instances. Mm -hmm. And that is also the history. That is the history. That, is, that history has dominated uh, um, our African-American political thought. And so this is why this is the origins as to why we're so radical. So we have to look at Africa. We have to go back to Africa, understanding that we came from African states mm -hmm. that had militaries, mm -hmm. you know, that were organized. And many of these states had scholars. They had engineers. Right? And some of them could read and write. We know this, as I said earlier, because many of them wrote their stories in Arabic and other languages when they got here. Mm -hmm. When they're mad, and many of them were even more educated than their plantation owners, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, hence comes this concept of the poor white trash, because you were dealing with a group of people who were literally descendant of royalty. They were descendant of kings and queens, and that that and that bloodline is still unbroken. Mm -hmm. So, before mm -hmm. the Civil War, that was the most consistent theme according to U.S. congressional records from the time that the United States became a state after they defeated the British, which they only defeated the British because Africans rebelled and took side to, with the British, and they lost. We lost, and some of us went to Nova Scotia. Some of us were forced back into enslavement here, but, but we never stopped fighting. We always fought. Mm -hmm. And um, and had not the Civil War uh, um, taken had taken place, uh, uh, the U.S. would have more than likely been like Haiti because we were a majority in many places where we are, where mm -hmm. we were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so bring us up now to emancipation and the continuity of that struggle before, in terms of organizing for freedom. What did we do? after emancipation. For an example, it was against the law for blacks uh, to learn to read or write. I mean, you could lose your hand, you could lose your life for trying to learn how to read. Mm -hmm. The number of schools, what kind of organization, I mean, what took place among African in America well, after let, the Civil let, War? Let me put this, even before the Civil War, we had independent black schools. They were headed by black churches. You had the African church, right? And Dr. Clark talks about, John Henry Clark talks about the African church, uh, um, the, the first African church of South Carolina, the first African church of Louisiana, which ended up uh, uh, um, running into, uh, uh, being transformed into the African Methodist Episcopal and the Af mm -hmm. African Methodist uh, um, Zion. But you also had the African Baptist churches, right? Mm -hmm. And so these were also the first sovereign institutions based on Africans, this African society, sovereign societies that these people came from. And mm -hmm. I cannot emphasize that enough. These were African people mm -hmm. re-engaging themselves into African societies, mm -hmm. trying to recreate 
from the best of their abilities the society that they were forcefully taken from taken from so they were not removed many of them uh, even in the 1880 census we had more than 10,000 African born people in this country in 1880 meaning that they were born in Africa mm -hmm. many of them and who survived this the transatlantic slave trade mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. 10,000 black people Mm -hmm. At the Civil War, we had more than 50,000 Africans who were born in Africa, who were born mm -hmm. in Africa, mm -hmm. living in the United States, throughout the South. Mm -hmm. We know this because of the WPA records, the, the Workers' Pro Progress Administration records, mm -hmm. that FDR, for, um, um, uh, FDR um, set up at, during the uh, Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And people like Zora Neale Hurston, and others will go down to the South and interview many of these people. By 1920, we had about 5,000 African-born people. And we had 50,000, 1920, we had 50,000 black people whose parents or grandparents were born in Africa. In how, 1920. Out of a population, out of, a population of how many uh, million? Maybe black? a million people, but still, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. So Africa wasn't too far away, and even places like Alabama. Mm -hmm. The last ship, enslaved ship, came in 1864. Mm -hmm. And that person, who, the, the last living survivor of 365 Africans who were on that ship died in 1943. Mm -hmm. And he was out and he had grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And his descendants are still alive. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine the stories that he told. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? Yes. <laughs> this yes. is a man who was brought over to this country in 1864. He was a baby. He was six or seven. Mm -hmm. He survived that. Mm -hmm. He had children after enslavement and lived mm -hmm. in Alabama and had grandchildren mm -hmm. and fought to his life, death to return back to Africa. Mm -hmm. Fought in court. Right? So we're, you're dealing with a people who have a historical consciousness. And this is why Dr. Clark would always say you cannot destroy a people who are historically conscious. You can't mm. do it. It's impossible. Mm. They're going to always fight because mm. of, of, of the importance and understanding and the remembrance of their history. So before the Civil War, this is what was going on. Mm -hmm. it, it was a lot of fear among the white plantation south that Africans would one day overrun them because there were all of these resistance movements. It wasn't just Denmark Vesey and Gabriel Prosser and Nat Turner's. There were hundreds of other unheard heroes and heroines in our traditions who fought to end the, the horrible institution of slavery. Coupled with the fact that it was a dying institution anyway, but that's another story within itself but what i want to get in people's minds is that the resistant movement was the dominant theme during enslavement it was the dominant theme it wasn't all of us weren't just you know taking the weeded beatings um and laying down and even if we did they all had another plan we're going to mm -hmm. take it now, but at night, we're running. We're running <laughs> it, or we're burning mm -hmm. it down. That's been the history, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so with this backdrop of armed resistance movement or armed rebellions or armed liberation movements, we, we, we emerge uh, um, this, what some people will say, this radical political thought. We had Paul Cuffey before enslavement. We had Bishop Henry McNeil Turner who came after enslavement. So these, these radical black churches is nothing new. Mm, the mm. radical pastor, that is a part of the black or African, African American black political thought, mm. resistance. Do that is the dominant thing. Dr. Issa, how did this um, organized force what impact and what role then did it play within the victory of the North over the South? And would you say because of this 
organized struggle that Africans in America brought to the war that we liberated ourselves, liberated America, and America is what it is because of African people. How, how would you kind of lay that out for us so we can get a... Well, that, that, that is the historical truth. Um, anything, because of, uh, uh, America was, it was, and for the most part still is, but more then than now, but it's headed back that way. It was a totalitarian dictatorship. Mm -hmm. So when we say to totalitarian dictatorship, what, what comes to mind to most people when you say dictatorship, they think of Hitler, where mm -hmm. everything is controlled by the state. So that, that, is, that was the life of the African person in this country at mm -hmm. that time period before enslavement, that our total lives were controlled by the state and dictated by the state, right? And so with the coming of the Civil War and the ending of the Civil War, primarily because of the Afri African soldiers who, who willingly fought, many of them would have fought for free because they wanted revenge back on the people who raped, beat, sold their brothers and sisters, killed their mothers in front of them. They wanted revenge and that's a very human response. Any mm -hmm. group of people Mm -hmm. would have felt that way and would have mm -hmm. died to free themselves. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, yes, we, but I think to understand the political, the, po the, the, the politics leading up to the Civil War, there, there will have to be a lot more time put into a, 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 a lecture like that. But, yes, Without Africans fighting in the Civil War, America would have been two separate states. And mm -hmm. it was the African insurgent, insurgency that was um, dictated by African leaders such as uh, Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. such as um, Martin Delaney, and many other folk that helped the, the United States maintain um, um, its, um, uh, its status as a um, as a union, without without the Africans fighting willfully uh, uh, um, for their own freedom, it would have never taken place. Mm -hmm. The United States would have been two states without any doubt. Mm -hmm. And that is not to say that the South would have maintained slavery. They, there was no way they could have because uh, the Africans in many of those places were a majority. And eventually, Africans would have overran the South and set up a Haiti in the South. But mm -hmm. Um, the Africans who fought during the Civil War mm -hmm. most definitely saved that enterprise mm -hmm. for, for the, but this is where it becomes tricky, for the white mercantile class, industrial class of the North, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And so they were more mm -hmm. concerned with the United States um, moving forward because mm -hmm. cotton cotton was being produced all over the world at that time and so was sugar mm -hmm. and the, those were the two dominant crops after after mm -hmm. tobacco had failed and so if you have all of this cotton coming through the south and it's being shipped to europe to be processed um the industrialists of the north um didn't want that they wanted to process their own cotton and mm -hmm. sell the finished product. They didn't want mm -hmm. to process any more raw material. In order, and, and in order to do that, you needed labor. You needed skilled laborers in the factories that were growing in the north, like mm -hmm. New York City. Mm -hmm. You needed the labor. Mm -hmm. And so the South, who had become, uh, um, where enslavement was more of a um, cultural institution more than anything, because many of the plantation owners were in debt to the northern uh, 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 industrialists, uh, but it was a culture. Mm -hmm. They had grown accustomed to African um, um, dehumanization, mm -hmm. right? And so th there are other compelling political things going on to explain um, what's going on, but that will take um, another conversation. But what I want to hint at um, as we move into this Garvey period is that the dominant theme was within black political thought was African nationalism. 
mm -hmm. going back to Africa and, and reclaiming the greatness that many of these African people were taken from. And that mm -hmm. was the dominant thing. So if you have in 1888 uh, or 1885, 20 years after the end of the Civil War, um, uh, 10,000 or more people who were born in Africa, 10,000. Mm -hmm. So that means that these people understood their Africanness mm -hmm. more than mo most people would like to think otherwise. Mm -hmm. They understood, some of them understood exactly what part of Africa they came from. They understood mm -hmm. the rituals. They understood the language. Mm -hmm. Right? And so um, if you were in an area like uh, New Orleans, uh, where I wrote my, my study on in 8, 1920 when Garvey comes, mm -hmm. and your grandmother, you knew your grandmother. Mm -hmm. Your grandmother uh, raised you until she died, and she was born in Africa. Mm -hmm. What do you think the conversation would have been in that household? Mm. What uh, type of she would have told you about yes Africa about mm -hmm. Africa, and if you can go back, you should mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. this is how it was as compared to where we are now, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so even before Garvey, mm -hmm. before Garvey, mm -hmm. there were numerous a uh, Pan Africanist institutions mm -hmm. in the South. All right, and as I started with the black churches, starting with black education. So when the uh, missionaries after the Civil War and the missionaries came to the South, they were shocked that there were already there there that that there were already five hundred independent black schools five within five hundred yeah. within yeah. what period within, within the five year period yeah. after the Civil War. Wow. Education was the dominant thing among African people. Some people say because it was denied. I'd like to say, no, we came from educational institutions in Africa. Mm -hmm. In fact, Chancellor Williams talks about the education of Africa in his book, um, The Miseducation, I mean, in his book, Destruction of the Black Civilization. Mm -hmm. He has a chapter on mm -hmm. the education, what processes people go through as far as education but then you also had written traditions mm -hmm. as I stated many of those Africans who were brought here came from a long tradition of written tradition a long history of written traditions mm -hmm. so this existed also mm -hmm. I already discussed Paul Kofi and other groups mm -hmm. of Africans Martin Delaney right before the Civil War uh, in 1854 there were two conventions from 1854 and 1858. 1854 was the, the National Negro Convention where black people, all the black free leadership came together in Cincinnati, Ohio and had decided that they were gonna to return to Africa. Some of them voted not to. But then after the um, case of um, Dred Scott, which was 1857, Mm -hmm. Those that African leadership that said they were not ready to go back to Africa when you not when the United States government said that no African could ever be a citizen of the United States that resurged and they raised more than four thousand dollars for Martin Delaney mm -hmm. four thousand dollars in eighteen fifty eight mm -hmm. which is probably about five six hundred thousand dollars today mm -hmm. the black community raised for him to go to Africa to find safe havens for African Americans to return. And Martin Delaney had negotiated four spots with various African kings, so that Africa, and four treaties, so that they can return back to Africa. But this money was raised by black people, that mm -hmm. amount of money at that time period to go back to Africa. This was mm. the dominant thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this is why I say even at the Civil War, after the Civil War ended, and the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, the 14th Amendment, which gave African people their citizenship, and the 15th Amendment, which granted uh, um, the right to vote, no one conveyed or even asked these Africans who were freed, allegedly freed, because 
the 13th Amendment really didn't free African people. It only transferred slavery from the individual white Southern owner to the state. Mm. The state controlled it. They took it. That's why there's a clause in the 13th Amendment. Except. <laughs> you are free except unless you were what? Convicted mm -hmm. of a crime. Mm -hmm. So they took it from the individual plantation owner and transferred it to the state. Mm -hmm. All right? Because they had to control these Africans. Uh, what do you do with all of these black men? Mm -hmm. right? The state is going to control them. And if they get out of line, they will incarcerate them and have their labor controlled that way. But still, black African nationalism was always the central theme, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so when Garvey comes to the U.S. in 1914, 1916, right at the backdrop of Booger T. Washington dying, this is what he encountered. He started off in Harlem. He got a letter from W.E.B. Du Bois. Mm -hmm. He took that letter and went on a 38 state trip and ended up in the South. And it was in the South that he realized that black people had all of these Pan-African institutions. And unlike what was going on in Jamaica, where the black uh, um, elite in Jamaica ran Garvey out of Jamaica twice. They ran him out. They didn't want him there. When he started the, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, you, UNIA in, in, in Jamaica. Uh, they ran Garvey out. They didn't want to hear that African nationalism talk. So when he got to the United States, he was shocked mm -hmm. that the dominant theme among black people right after World War I was what? Black nationalism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Black, in fact, from the Jim Crow era, from the end of the Reconstruction era of 1877, until the period that Garvey came, there was a there's a treasure of literature that deals not only were these Africans in the United States saying that they wanted to go back to Africa and set up African kingdoms and nations to compete with Europe, they were saying that they wanted to colonize all of Africa. So they were imperialistic in their thinking. <laughs> they weren't just saying we want to go back. No, we want to take it all <laughs> and come back and destroy all of Europe. In fact, there's a book by Michelle, um, a book um, called Righteous Discontent. No, you could. Yes, uh, there's a book that deals with this. Um, I'll provide that book to you shortly. That deals now, with this th entire period. Before Garvey came. This is before Garvey. They were talking, we want to go back to Africa in 1890. We're going to set it up. There's, I found some records at the National Archive, I mean at the Library of Congress. In 18, from 1878 to 1891, one of the biggest African liberation days was in New Orleans, where 10 to 20,000 black people from all over the South will come to New Orleans and celebrate Haiti's independence and Liberia's independence, and they even had bought ships to commerce and trade and sending black people back to Africa. Chief Afford Sam, who came to this country, a king from the, the gold, what is now called the gold, what was then called the Gold Coast of Ghana. Uh, he came from an area called Salt Pond, mm -hmm. right? And he wanted to do trade among African Americans. And he got here and ended up in Oklahoma. And many of those blacks in Oklahoma were recent transplants from Louisiana and Mississippi. And they told him, we don't want to do trade. We want to go back. Mm -hmm. And he, they raised money. They raised $20,000, bought a ship. And he took 300 black people with him in 1914. This is before Garvey. Mm. You had this going on even in Louisiana in 1916. Mm -hmm. To 1918, the leading black political organization was the African Interland Society that was headed by an uh, African um, who was the son of the last uh, um, paramount king of Uganda. Mm -hmm. And he headed a black organization in which 
um, um, in New Orleans, they ran, they competed with the NAACP mm -hmm. up until 1918. And it was mostly headed by black women. Mm -hmm. And they were about going back to Africa. And they were about, they were in the process of buying ships. This is 1916. But this theme was dominant throughout black America before Garvey came. And right? you said they, 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 they had ideas of going back, colonizing all Africa, and then taking all Africa and leading a war against Europeans. Europeans. Yes. To get them out of Africa. Get them out of Africa. Yes, that was the that, and yep. that was the dominant theme of the Garvey movement. That was the dominant theme, but this theme came from the Africans in the United States because of their long history of resistance. You didn't have this in the islands because there was a these were black majorities and Europeans were not the majority. It was Africans who were oppressing other Africans at this time period. <laughs> <laughs> but here in America, we had a white majority. So our, there was a clear enemy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so the institutions that were set up, like the black insurance companies, we had black Wall Streets. Mm -hmm. This was all done in opposition to white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And it all had, and most of them had an African theme to them. And even today, I know I'm jumping. But if you look, I was at the Million Man March in October of 2015, the 20th anniversary. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to go to the original one in 1995. But I noticed the dominant theme among the 800 to a million people who were there at that march. All you saw was a sea of red, black, and green. Yes, right. True. That's yeah. African national. This is among the youth. This was mostly 50% youth with red, black, and green flags and shoes and all type of coloring. That's African nationalism. So the dominant theme, at least for the next 40 years, is going to be that's going to be the dominant theme of black political thought. In Ferguson, the dominant theme of Ferguson was Asata Shakur. They even had white kids singing and chanting Asata Shakur. That's African nationalism. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So that is the, the dominant theme, right, of black political thought. It did not start with Garvey. Mm -hmm. But Garveyism represented the, what many will call the golden age. Mm -hmm. It represented a golden age, mm -hmm. but not the only golden age. Mm -hmm. We're in a golden age now. There was a golden age in the 70s, mm -hmm. right? But at that period, it was the apex coming right out of the uh, um, slavery uh, and, and, and this movement to set up well-organized African states that emerged here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Even the concept of being an African emerged here, emerged out of our struggle. In fact, one historian, he's right here in New York, he wrote a book called Exchanging Our Country Marks. Mm -hmm. He's right here. Who is he? Um, I can't. The, the book is called Exchange and I, uh, Michael Gomez. Okay. Right. He's. I think he's at City College or one of the New York colleges right here in the city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, where this book came out in 1998, should have gotten a prize um, because what he does is show at the Denmark Vesey uh, 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 um, armed resistance movement in South Carolina that that movement started when the various African nationalities on various plantations surrounding Charleston made a conscious decision to overthrow the government there and to set up an African empire. But there were various competing African national groups and, and, and kings competing for power. And Denmark Vesey stepped in and said, no, we have to exchange our country marks. It's changed our African identities because they were fighting on these plantations. You had the Igbos fighting the Yoruba mm -hmm. on the plantations. Mm -hmm. And you had the Hausas fighting the Eves on these plantations. Mm -hmm. They were divided until Denmark Vesey came in and said, no, we have to throw that away and become one people. And that is the beginning of African-American political thought.
mm. with that with with that armed resistance movement, mm. which almost had not one person told America would have been a Haiti, mm. right? Mm. But this mm. was the dominant thing, mm -hmm. and Garvey didn't create that. What Garvey was able to do with his skills, having traveled all over the world, having uh, been a a publisher. He was able to bring these competing African nationalist groups in the United States together mm -hmm. as one. Mm -hmm. And having mm -hmm. been an organizer, organizer in Jamaica and having fought the black elite in Jamaica who did not want this. Mm. As I told you, that even up until Garvey, up until um, uh, um, the 60s, Kwame Nkrumah, when Nkrumah decided that um, he wanted the bones and remains of Marcus Garvey removed from London and brought to Jamaica, brought to Ghana. That's when the Jamaican government stepped in. But up until then, they didn't want Garvey, mm. 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 right? But mm. Garvey was the Garvey that we know today was created among the African population in the United States, mm. Mm. right? That's what created Garvey and his mm. legacy. Mm -hmm. Right, and he was rejected even when he was thrown into prison in the United States and deported back to Jamaica. They ran him out. They tried to kill him, the Jamaican elite. Mm -hmm. So when they say, "Oh, we created Garvey," no, you didn't. <laughs> you 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 tried to kill him until he died. He died in London. He couldn't <laughs> oh, even go God. back to, to to Jamaica, and he said he would never go back because of the way they treated him. But we saw his vision here, and we gave refuge to his vision, as we did many other African people who shared our vision of freedom and, and self-determination and sovereignty. Mm -hmm. If you would look at the Africans in America in compared to, and we all want people, I mean, in terms of being African, uh, but what is it that differentiates the African-American and the focus, his focus on liberation from other Caribbean. Well, if we look at the West Indies specifically, they've always had the illusion of a nation state, right? Mm -hmm. Where there are black majorities in Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago, right? But it's still, these are still uh, uh, properties of the Queen mm -hmm. of England, mm -hmm. right? In the United States, we've never had that illusion. Mm -hmm. Because it was a hostile, it was and is a hostile, dominant society um, that, that, that wants to control every aspect of African freedom here in this country. We've never had that illusion. That illusion of us only crept up over the last 40 years among the black elite. And that delusion as President Obama is, is, is speedily headed out of office, is falling apart, mm -hmm. right? So for us, in our history here, that has never been an illusion. It's always been us against them, and, and, and only for a very short period, <laughs> right after the Civil Rights Movement, where that was a war. The Civil Rights and Black Power Movement was a war. And there was a treaty signed to end that war. And those treaties emerged with Dr. King and the civil rights leadership with the civil rights, various civil right, rights acts. Those were treaties. We have to look at it differently. We have to look at our history as a sovereign people. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Educational Acts, Affirmative Action, those were treaties signed to end the war. Because it cost this government billions of dollars to fight that war. Okay, y'all want resources, y'all want access? We will give it to you and we will pay for it. Those mm -hmm. were treaties. Mm -hmm. Right? And the, 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 the European elite said they were temporary treaties until we got enough of y'all food so we can take it back. And that's what we're witnessing. Mm -hmm. mm. Let's talk about those treaties and let's talk about what led to those treaties in terms of, if we look at, uh, uh, I know after Dr. King, you had 122 cities across America that went up in flames. You had Newark, you had Detroit and so right. forth. What, what, what led to that in the organizing forces that came together that was able to execute? that kind of 
force against this country. Yeah, it was a unified African force. Yeah, the, and these unified African forces came from the Black Belt, where African people were in the majority, where they had a history and remembrance of Africa. Africa is the key. Mm -hmm. It's always the key. They try mm -hmm. to tell you that it's not, but it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Africa is always the key. Okay. And mm -hmm. that is the issue right now. If, if these young people begin to remember Africa, okay. it's always about Africa. Because in the South, mm -hmm. where black people were the majorities mm -hmm. uh, during the civil rights uh, 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 movement, they were living in independent African communities, mm -hmm. segregated African mm -hmm. communities, mm -hmm. right? And that sovereignty of being segregated, some black people didn't know anything about uh, 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 white discrimination to that extent mm -hmm. because they really didn't have to encounter that many white people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like my family, they they didn't. You know, my grandmother told me I, they didn't have to deal with white people. They had the independent black schools. They had their own stores. They heard many of the stories, but they themselves were protected because they lived in these sovereign communities. Mm -hmm. and, but I think um, the hostility that was created as more and more black people became educated and became international, right? Mm -hmm. And it was an international movement. It wasn't just our movement here, but at the end of the World War II, Europe again is decimated like after mm -hmm. World War I. Mm -hmm. And they need these resources. But you had a lot of African troops, both from the Caribbean, from the United States, and from the continent of Africa itself, who had, went, who had gone to Europe and fought. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they killed white people. Mm -hmm. And they found out that white people could die the way black people were dying. Mm -hmm. And they were not going to come back home being, uh, after being fully trained in the latest mm -hmm. forms of modern warfare and still um, be lynched. Mm -hmm. Right? And mm -hmm. so that is World War II and the Korean War was the backdrop to understanding the black freedom struggle that took place in the 60s, in 50s, 50s 60s, and 70s. Because if we remember, the, the, the head of the Mississippi NAACP was headed by who during that period? Megger who? Evans. Evans. And what was his military background? Mm. He was military, right? Yes. Yeah, he fought in the Korean War. And many of his leadership within it. So they weren't afraid of white people. And they killed white people. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and they fought in the Korean War. And they killed other nationalities. So they weren't coming back to the United States to endure that same treatment. Mm -hmm. They weren't. Mm -hmm. and, and originally it wasn't a movement for integration. It wasn't. It was a movement to honor, uh, 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 to challenge the U.S. Constitution which the Bill of Rights stated, the Bill of Rights and the um, amendments, the African amendments of the 13th, the, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments are African amendments. They're African Revolution treaties. <laughs> and we have to see them as that. Mm -hmm. Right? These are treaties that were signed mm -hmm. because we helped the industrialists save this country. Right? But again, as I started off, those Africans who were released from slavery, no one asked them if they wanted to be citizens of this country. They didn't mm -hmm. take a census. Mm -hmm. They didn't go to the black leadership and say, you represent your people. Uh, what do your people want? No. Mm -hmm. Because had they asked African people at that time period, what do you want? They just say, I want to go home. I want to go die. home. I don't want to mm -hmm. be with you. You just mm -hmm. raped me. You raped my mama, you raped, you, you, you raped my daddy, you mm -hmm. sold my sister, I saw you beat a man to death, I saw you, I saw you give my children to crocodiles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Send me back to where you got me from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So since, as I started off, many of these African people did not give up their citizenships in Africa, that means that they still 
whole citizenship in many of these African states. Mm -hmm. And many of these African states who have raw courts are illegitimate because the legitimate heirs are here in the Caribbean mm -hmm. and are in South America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And once we begin to mm -hmm. understand that, that's going to be another issue that we're going to have to deal with. And it's going to happen. It's starting to happen now. People are doing DNA. And oh, they're so finding I'm out. Oh, I'm from it. here. And some mm -hmm. of their ancestors are coming back and telling them that they are royalty from this place and this mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Mm -hmm. If one family in Africa has occupied a throne for 300 years because you were stolen, stolen, was sold, sold away, what happens? You know, and these mm -hmm. are issues that the African world will have to deal with mm -hmm. in the next 50, 30 to 40 years because mm -hmm. this is what's mm -hmm. going to happen. It's happening now. Be before we, we move there, and I want to move there, but... <clears throat> I want to uh, look at a backdrop in terms of. I think um, I have to break for a second. Something's oh, worth. He's passed well, away let now. Go, right. Let me go right. get my so, shoes and my coat now. Gotta go. The Selma You're March and the go every yes, 50 it's years to celebrate that. Yes, it's not me that your husband yeah. is seeing. Thank you very so, much. Oh. Oh, when uh, I got a shortcut, I got to get it. That's my I'm so glad you changed to me because you got to take my uncle. in 2000. <laughs> Cannot have you taking my uncle. And, there you go. Uh, that's myself. You know who that is. Uh, so. Now, this is, uh, I have an extra copy of that. You can have that. That's okay. in 1948 when I got arrested in Birmingham, Alabama for allowing a white and black group to meet at a church that I was serving at the time. We in had 48? In 48. We had to go to jail for that. So that's a picture of us, the three of us. There was another man. How long were you in jail? Oh, about a couple of hours. I got an attorney, called an attorney, came and got me out. 1948. Oh, 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 and, uh... This was an integrated meeting of blacks and whites mm -hmm. sitting in a church with no sign saying Negro and white. So that's what they put me in jail for, breaking the segregation law. I think that's the full How old were you then? I was 23. That's you to the far left? Yeah. Right here? Yeah, that's me. Let me see who's here. What's this about? Yeah, there we are. That's mm -hmm. an enlarged picture. That's you. That's me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the Reverend Dombrowski, James Dombrowski. He was a leader in the group that came down there. And that's a woman came down from New York, Doris Sink. And uh, we went to jail for having this meeting at the church, an unsegregated meeting. And that was in 1948. And that's the first challenge, open challenge of a group that came down to meet in Birmingham on an interracial basis. The first time there was a challenge of segregation. Right. It was there in 1948. Right. And I was involved in that and went to jail for that. And I thought that I'd never get a church because I had it, was serving a small church then and uh, they took the place away from us, demanded that I, um, that I express uh, regret for it. I wouldn't do that. So I was out of there. That was in a church called the Christian and Missionary Alliance. So I was uh, really banished from that organization. Can I? Where are you? Right here, with, this, with the plastic. Uh, cover on my hat and uh, Reverend. Where is that? Where are you? Right here with the plastic cover on my hat. And next to him was Reverend Harold Long, who served the. Well, right here? Right you there. Looking down? Looking down with, the with your sunglasses. That's okay. me. Where's ben, Bernie Sanders at? Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. John Lewis said he was nowhere to be found. <laughs> but, and Hillary was everywhere. Yeah. 
Yeah. What's but, wrong with him? You with John Lewis. What happened to him? He stole, he stole a serving. No, I was there, but he came out and said that Bernie Sanders was nowhere to be found in the civil rights movement, and Hillary and, Hillary and Bill was everywhere. But it seems like Hillary and Bill was nowhere to, nowhere be, found. to be found. No. And Bernie Sanders was all over all the photos with Dr. King. Yeah, he went down there. But uh, Bill and Hillary. You know, so why did John found. Lewis lie like that? He's a Democrat, and they're Democrats. That means they're liars. Uh, well, he doesn't. He doesn't mean it that way. But they were nowhere to be found. In yeah, fact, so talk lied. about talk about how they're trying to uh, change the leadership of the civil rights movement. We went down there. Okay, that's another. We need to sit down. Please do. We had the opportunity to be here in the home of Reverend C. Herbert Oliver, uh, one of the. Oh, wow. One of the architects of the Birmingham, Alabama, uh, stay out of downtown shopping for black folk. In fact, it was Reverend was Oliver who called for. What year was it? 1962. Oh, wow. It was Reverend Oliver who asked black people to stay out of downtown Birmingham shopping. So, um, uh, it's, it's my great, great pleasure to be here in his home, and we have Dr. Isa, uh, Isa. <laughs> I pronounce that, Dr. Isa. Isa, that's fine. Isa. Um, and so it gives me great pleasure for these two historians and uh, activists uh, to talk to one another. The question that I had asked uh, the other brother, uh, Dr. Isa, was did the civil rights movement, uh, did integration affect, how did it affect, was it negative or positive integration on the black community, the black movement, the African-centered movement? How, how, how did it affect African-Americans, integration? Right. Um, I mean, it was horrific. It, <laughs> We have a whole, I'll put it like this. In 1960, W.E.B. Du Bois, in his last speech in the United States, he did it from Johnson C. Smith University in North Carolina. It's called Whither Why or Now. And basically he prophesied 40 years to the year 2000 what integration would do to black people and what the current civil rights leadership was doing at that time that they were driving black people into extinction. I write about this in my last article on how black colleges are turning white, the ethnic cleansing of HBCUs in the age of Obama. That's the title. And I start off with this long quote from W.E.B. Du Bois. He said, by the year 2000, there will be less and less school teacher, black school teachers, black people, or less and fewer and fewer black kids will want to go to college. They will want nothing to do with Africa and would identify more with their Native American blood than with their um, the Native American blood than with their African blood. And they will lose contact with the rising African world. Up until then, it, our struggle has had always been with Africa. And Du Bois said this before he left, the problems of integration. He prophesied, and it's a very long but very important article because he's looking into the future, being a futuristic intellectual. So now we see that everything that he prophesied about has come to fruition. Um, our struggle, particularly that was waged with people like Reverend Oliver, the sacrifices that were made, the deaths, to make sure that a group is advanced. Many of those struggles and those treaties that we signed, as we call them, bills and, and amendments and all of these things, but they were treaties, really, um, to, to a, a treaty to end the war. 
that was waged because it cost the federal government billions of dollars. The struggle that we waged, and they didn't want to, they didn't feel it was worth it. So they said, okay, if all they want to do is be included, we will let them in for a period of time. But we must take the souls and spirits of their minds in their youth. And that's what they did for 30 years until hip hop came. And that's how I came into my consciousness through hip hop. That's how I learned about Africa and our struggle and our history through groups like Public Enemy. And then those generations that came after me they had nothing, and we see them with the Black Lives Matter, and there's uh, other genders are put in front of them, particularly that of the um, gay and lesbian gender. That comes first, and, and that is the driving point of the Black Lives Matter movement. So, yes, integration has destroyed us, and I don't know without the divine <coughs> providence of God stepping in um, the next 20 years as it regards our 400 year sojourn in this country uh, 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 could be quite different and um, um, that's that's why yeah so it has uh, 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 um, destroyed uh, black people in our international movement it has destroyed up until then it was always international with Africa at the center of it Reverend Oliver what is your thinking on integration, its effect on the black movement? Well, when I, I'd have to go back to 1948 when I first got involved and uh, was put in jail for allowing Negroes and white people to sit together in a church without signs saying Negroes and whites and separating the races. And that was in 1960, pardon me, 1948. And uh, we were opposed to segregation. And uh, there were, uh, it was just everywhere in Birmingham. Segregation was the way of life in Birmingham. You had uh, uh, Negro and white separate restrooms eating places, um, there was white water and there was Negro water and everything was totally separated and that's the atmosphere in which I grew up and I was very much opposed to it and there was a minister there in Birmingham uh, who, well I say in Birmingham but he was in Ensley Reverend Lee, who was very successful in getting Negroes to register and vote. And uh, he was supposedly in the white neighborhood being a peeping Tom, and he was shot by the police. And uh, the black community knew that this was not so. I learned that he had raised a family of 13. Mm. He was 63 years old, a man highly respected in the Negro community. And I went to the funeral home where his body was and stood over him and uh, said that if something is not done about this, then one day you'll be lying here and that will be the end of you. And so I did not know that, with the, that was in January 1948, and I didn't know that uh, this meeting was coming up to be held in May of 1948, an integrated m a group that was coming to Birmingham, and Bull Connor had uh, vowed that they would obey segregation or they would not come. And so... Uh, I saw and followed the events, and I had uh, decided that if there was something I could do, I would. This group was scheduled to meet with the uh, 16th Street Baptist Church that was only one block away from the church that I was serving at that time. And the minister there, uh, Reverend Luke Beard, uh, under Connor's threats, canceled the meeting. 
a day or two before they were to be held. And uh, the leader of the group made contact with a Negro minister in uh, the south side of Birmingham, and he agreed, but in about a half an hour, he too had been contacted by Bull Carter, and he declined. So then I went to the group. I knew him personally, uh, Louis Burnham, and told him that I'm serving a small church here. If you would like to meet here, you're very welcome, and he accepted. So he did not put it on the phone where we were meeting. He just put the address down, and people came and took her. He would give them a slip of paper, and they, with that, they would come to the place where they could meet. So the meeting uh, was held. The first session, uh, it was a two-day meeting, the first session was um, over before the police found out. But they found out in the afternoon, and they came and read to us the segregation code of Birmingham and said that we were violating the law and that we should disperse. And we did not disperse. And uh, that's when uh, James Dombrowski, Doris Sink, and Eddie Forey were arrested and taken to jail. And they came back and uh, asked who was in charge of the property. I told them I was. So they said, we are arresting you too. So they arrested me. And uh, I was taken to jail and fingerprinted. I called Attorney Shores, and he came and got me out within a couple of hours. Then we went back to the church and cut down the weeds and made a path to the back entrance of the church. And we decided that if they got to have segregation, they'd have to go to the back entrance. So that became the white entrance, the back of the church where the weeds cut down. That was the white entrance and Negroes, or black people, could come into the front door. Now, Bull Connor enforced this because the law itself did not say that white people have to come at the front. They left that out. So he was free to force them to go, force white people to go to the back, which was really not good segregation. Uh, but that's what he did. And the next day, Senator Glenn Taylor was to be the featured speaker in the morning, which was a Sunday morning. And he came to the church not knowing what had happened. And when he attempted to go into the front do door of the church, uh, he was told that he had to go around the back and come into the back entrance. And he didn't understand that, so he I proceeded to go in, but an officer was standing with his arm over the door. And an officer standing on the ground, uh, which was uh, the, there was a step, six or seven steps up to the entrance. And there was a policeman on the ground there, and he grabbed the senator by his arm and flung him off of the porch and sent him spinning over a barbed wire fence and blooded his shin. And they up, scooped him up and took him to jail. That's how he got arrested. Uh, well, that, uh, that made news. Uh, Paul Robeson commented about that when he was uh, getting ready to make a trip. It hit uh, national and international news. So that's my introduction to the struggle uh, against segregation. I don't know that I was so much for integration, but I just wanted segregation out of the way, mm -hmm. and we could make our choice as to who we wanted to be with. Yes. But that's how uh, I got involved, and I did not know at the time. Uh, there were no other groups, there were no civil rights groups, there were no uh, activists involved, and I felt that uh, having been arrested, I would never be called to serve a church. And uh, I think I was right. But I didn't know that God uh, had some people around the corner, we might say. Uh, six years later, when Dr. King uh, was arrested and jailed and led so many people to the jails in Montgomery, and Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, who founded the 
Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights, uh, challenged segregation and was beaten and jailed for it many times. Uh, within a few years, within not less than six years, <coughs> then uh, the walls of segregation began to crumble and they eventually crumbled under the, the uh, powerful uh, leadership of Dr. King and uh, Reverend Shuttlesworth. So now having been arrested, it means now that it's an honor to have been arrested in those days. So it was not against me to, uh, to have been jailed. Uh, in 1965, I got a, got a call to come to Brooklyn to serve a Presbyterian church, and I came, and uh, that's when I left Birmingham. So that's how I got involved. But we were not then thinking about the effect that uh, uh, integration. Uh, integration would have on the black community. How? Because, but we knew that. Uh, there were black businesses that were uh, uh, booming. We uh, had a, a new young man there in the neighborhood where I lived who had a, a meat market and a grocery store. And he just made money hand over hand and hand over foot uh, during that whole time because uh, black people came to him and bought from him. But. Uh, those stores, uh, I do have a clipping not at my, on my hand right now, but in January 1963, uh, Dun and Bradstreet put out a statement which said that during 1962, more than 500 businesses in Birmingham had closed. Why? Why? Because people were not shopping downtown. It was in 1962 that it began. It was on August the 2nd that uh, the announcement was made in the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights for Negroes to stay out of downtown Birmingham. They didn't say boycott, they just said stay out of downtown Birmingham. And that was not against the law. So we did not use the term boycott. But uh, Negroes began to stay out of downtown Birmingham and I would go every day at the peak of the shopping hour and count all the Negroes in downtown stores in Birmingham in Pizzitz, Lovemans, Crest, Woolworth, and Newberry. Those were the main places, the five and ten stores uh, where Negroes went. Uh, Lovemans, of course, was uh, not a five and ten. Lovemans was the equivalent of a Bloomingdale's now uh, here, and Macy's was the equivalent of, Macy's was the equivalent, equivalent of uh, Pizzitz in Birmingham. So I would go around every day and count the Negroes who were shopping in those stores on the first floor and come back to the movement each Monday night and report my count. And uh, when we started there were thousands of Negroes all over those stores shopping and shopping and spending. I would come back to Monday night and report it to the mass meeting and uh, by April 19th, I didn't realize that it, ha it had been so effective that the Birmingham uh, News came out with an article headlined, Don't Blackjack Birmingham, and a letter from the editor saying that Negroes were doing the wrong thing. It was going to hurt Negroes more than anybody else. I wrote back on the 19th and told the editor that I did not think so and that we had tried everything to, uh, to bring about better human relations, but uh, we were not able to, so we're simply staying out of the stores until things get better. So uh, that's how that began. The Miles College students under the leadership of uh, Dr. Pitts joined the movement and helped to uh, get the word out and uh, pick it in downtown and uh, try to urge Negroes to stay out of downtown, period. It was no law. It was not breaking the law to stay out of downtown Birmingham. So they couldn't charge us with uh, violating the boycott law. 
So that continued uh, when Dr. King came. It was the following year. It was in the spring of 1963. And the boycott had already been effective for a year. So, uh, but it was more effective when Dr. King came and uh, led people to the jails and in protests and demonstrations. And Bull Connor responded with fire hoses and uh, um, dogs. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get all the pictures of uh, Bull Connor doing everything he could to stay uh, the fight against segregation. He did only what he knew how to do, and he, he did not know how to handle the situation, and all he could do was bring force, and uh, that played right into the hands of those who were struggling against segregation. Now, afterwards, I did discover some years later that those, biz those black businesses that were in Birmingham basically went out of business. And as I look back, I say, wow, that, uh, that we did not intend, but that was the, the result of our fighting against uh, segregation with all our might. It really did away with, um, with uh, those who were able within that segregated system to form businesses and prosper. But we, that was not uh, the uppermost uh, element or thought in our minds. Mm -hmm. Now, what you say about uh, about Dubois, uh, I uh, I did not. Uh, I was not in, had no contact with Dubois. Never met him. Uh, but I do know that he opposed Marcus Garvey with all of his might. And uh, I, I, I don't know. I haven't studied to find out what was his rationale. But what he has predicted uh, was, was quite true, that uh, the segregation mind was not broken by our struggle. It's still here, and it is very, very strong. The separate mentality still governs this country. And my efforts to find out why uh, led me to reading the Constitution several times, and I did read it at least uh, for 40 times to try to find out what is happening now from this Constitution. And I found out that this Constitution that we have, the Constitution of 1787, does not define citizenship. It uses the word citizen over and over again, but it doesn't define who a citizen is. So when I look in on the computer to find out when George Washington became a citizen, I couldn't find it. It's not there. When, the, when did the Thomas Jefferson and the leaders of the Revolution War, Revolutionary War against England, when did they become citizens? They never did. They never thought about it, but they used the words uh, citizen and called themselves citizens and assumed that they were citizens. But uh, they were not because there's no constitutional definition of citizen. And we are just left out of it altogether except as slaves. And uh, we were that the slaveholders were given extra representation in Congress by having people in slavery. Mm. So that's what I found out, and that has not changed. The Constitution has not changed. Uh, the Fourteenth Amendment uh, is supposed to have been a change of the Constitution for the better, but it was uh, never ratified, and it was never uh, pursued in the way that the Constitution says that you must follow in order to um, uh, become a citizen. So <clears throat> we are still now not citizens. It, uh, the 14th Amendment was never ratified. It was declared ratified by Congress, but it was never ratified with votes. So it's a fraud. 
And when uh, Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice Roger Taney made his ruling, summed up in the words that a Negro has no rights that a white man is bound to respect, he's strictly constitutional because the Constitution does not give Negroes any rights at all, and that has not changed. And the ruling of the Supreme Court remains there until it is superseded by another ruling or overruled by another ruling, and no ruling has yet, that is, no ruling of the Supreme Court has yet uh, overruled the decision of uh, Roger Taney in 1857. So basically, we are not citizens in that particular constitution, and we have no rights in that particular constitution, and that is in effect today. Now, uh, Dr. Uh, Issa, can you define, uh, can you lay out for us more clearly the reason you say segregation was a very devastating uh, movement or ploy. Uh, I don't know if you would define it as ploy, but a very... Well, I, I understand what you're going, but I think the approach we tend to fail, we, we, we fail to not really analyze is why were we brought to this country? Uh, right. Who brought us here and what was our initial purpose of being here? And even after enslavement, why did why was the thirteenth amendment passed? Why was the fourteenth amendment passed and the fifteenth amendment? And who did it benefit the most? Why was uh, uh, um, why was these are just questions. Why, and understanding our history, why was Dred Scott a watershed case in Plessy versus Ferguson? And who did it benefit? And even if we move up to Brown, who did Brown benefit the most? And why was that decision important? Who did it save? And who did it benefit? All right. So if we put all of that, our history did not begin with enslavement. Our history begins in Africa, in the places that we were taken from. We were taken from African kingdoms, as I stated earlier. And even when the 13th, 14th, and the 15th Amendment were passed, no one went to those Africans who were enslaved in the American South and asked them, what is your opinion? As if they didn't have an opinion. They had opinions. If you can set up 500 schools within a decade after the Civil War, then obviously you were thinking before the Civil War. They had opinions. No one asked them what they wanted, if they wanted to be citizens. And why would they have wanted to be citizens after going through 200 and something years of some of the most brutal treatment of human beings, of humanity? and more importantly, of those who created humanity. There's no humanity outside of African people. Humanity starts in East Africa with African people, with black people. Civilization starts there. So my questions are a bit different. And looking at segregation and whether it destroyed us or whether we benefited from it because ultimately the history of our people in this country has, although we've had some very dignified struggles, has always been at the whims of the white elite or the European elite. They control the power apparatus in this society to the point where a peaceful man such as Dr. Martin Luther King who never killed anyone, was shot in his head, brutally. They didn't poison him. They wanted to make an example, so they blew off his head. To another man who 
was not known to have killed anyone. Malcolm X was shot 22 times in front of his wife and infant children to make examples. That he could have poisoned them. Hugo Chavez of, of Venezuela said that he believed that the U.S. poisoned him. They, they have other ways of killing people that they feel are a threat. And when these type of decisions are made, they're not coming from someone, the lowest of European society, they're coming from the top. So our history has been that, although we have struggled and we've had a beautiful struggle, but it's also been a history of domination of one group against another. And that's mostly been because of what Du Bois, du Bois called the failure of our leadership particularly during that time period. We thought that it was a great thing to feel that, or that we really believed that the Constitution was written for us and that we were included in it. And that one day you're the European elite would just wake up and say, hey, treat these people like we want to be treated. But mm -hmm. that hasn't happened yet and it probably will never happen. So I think we have to re-examine our history from our natural origins to what is happening today to see if we have benefited collectively as compared to the dominant group, mm -hmm. right? And I think mm -hmm. if we honestly assess that, we will have to say no. And if, that, if we have to say no, then we have to reassess our history and our understanding of our relationship with the dominant group to the point of do they want us here? And if they want us here, do they want us to share power? Because ultimately that's what it's about, being able to control one's life. And Reverend, as you were saying, the, the Garvey movement, yes, I mean, that was about us deciding for it as a group where we said, okay, these people, they enslaved us, they Jim Crowed us, we don't want to be a part of them. In fact, we have a right, just like the founding fathers of this country made the decision that they wanted to go back. They wanted to split from England and set up their own nation state. And that's the highest form of humanity's dealings with God is being able to govern your own self to make sure that your future generations have a chance in sharing Earth's resources. So to that extent, do we want to share power or do we want to constantly have our history interpreted by those who don't want us to share power? These have been the things that we used to talk about. We don't talk about this anymore. We Even our questions are geared in a sense of a defeatist um, group of people where we've been defeated. Our questions are not geared toward do we want to rule ourselves? And what process needs to take place if we say we are a group of people? What processes need to take place for us to rule ourselves? What are those processes? Do we have historical examples? Are there other human examples where a group of people who've been humiliated and degraded and treated so bad what decisions have they made to get out of that situation? Mm -hmm. So I think our questions, we need a better understanding of our relationship to the ruling elite. They don't even trust the white masses. There's a book written by Michael Parente called Democracy for the Few. This book was written in the 80s. Democracy for the Few. That, and now there was a study that came out at Princeton University three years ago saying that America is an oligarchy mm. ran by 1% of European families. So if America is an oligarchy ran by a, a small group of European families, what is our historical existence under that? Mm. And can we ever run this country or, or, or run our lives without constant fear of terror and threats and where our best minds tend to always go to waste. Mm. Seems to me that we've been in perpetual warfare since we've been here.
mm. and to the point where we don't even understand that it's warfare anymore because it has become culture and the norm, the brutality. Mm. So I think our questions and our understanding of history must be reassessed and looking at our history from the point of view of the dominant group in our relationship toward them. Is it enough to have somebody black as president? Does that guarantee prob um, freedom and power for a group of people who, whose history is mired in enslavement and degradation and fighting against that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, my, my approach toward history is, is, is different from the typical integrationalist, revisionist history. I say that first, no one asked, uh, we, first we never gave up our citizenship and our royal families in Africa. We never gave up. And I make that argument all the time. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when the, fourth, when the ruling elite of this country made the decision to give us freedom, they didn't ask any of us where, if we wanted to be citizens. Mm. Right? And nobody in Africa has gone back to the royal families there and asked them, did we come from there and did they take our citizenship away from there? No one has asked these important questions because the goal of the ruling elite to constantly rule over us it has always been to take Africa out of it, period to take the Africa question out of, mm, mm. so that we don't even ask these questions, these very essential questions. So that's my <laughs> um, analysis. I know it's kind of different, but it's based on my experience and my readings of our, 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 our sojourn in this society. But I have a question for the great reverend, and I'm honored to be here as uh, as, a hist uh, as a professionally trained historian and an archivist. I was reading um, a quote um, that you said that being, there's a difference between being African American and black. And being black is an experience. Yeah. And, but you didn't define what being an African American is and what it means. And I, I would like to get some understanding because I, I've been thinking about that. That's the first thing I wanted to ask you. Okay. Well, African American is a term that uh, black people did not choose. Mm. Uh, it seems to me that uh, that was uh, a term that uh, Jesse Jackson preferred. Mm -hmm. And whites went along with Jesse Jackson and began calling us Af Afro-Americans mm. or African Americans. Mm. There's a friend of mine, Avis Smith, who has written a book on that. He mm. took Jackson to court mm. and said that he had uh, he had no right to put a name on people who had not themselves chosen. So uh, then there there are lots of other names: Negroes and uh, blacks. Up until 1960, you couldn't use the term black mm. in this community of, of uh, people who grew out of slavery. Mm. Why? Black it was too was, radical. No, no. It was, there was too much color prejudice. Ah. So when you call somebody black, that's a war. You fight mm. and settle it wherever you are. It's like calling somebody African. Yeah. Well, no, 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 not African. People never went to war nor fought if you call them African. Ah. But if, when I was growing up, if you call somebody black, that was almost like a curse word. Mm. So you just didn't do that. We spoke of colored people mm. and light-skinned Negroes, but uh, but you didn't say black-skinned Negroes. No. It wasn't until the '60s when uh, people became, after James Brown saying, "I'm black and I'm proud," uh, that began to take on, and we just gradually got to the point where we could use the term black with dignity. Right. And that took uh, many years, many decades, but it began in the 60s with uh, the black is beautiful. 
that civil rights leaders began to use that phrase, black is beautiful, mm. until it got to the point now where it's, uh, it's an honor to be called black. Mm. And people of light skin color can speak of black people and not have to apologize or go to war. Mm. Because that has been a basic change within the black community. Now back to your question. Uh, Dr. Issa, tell me again, give me that your question again because I think I've lost the essence of it. You said black is an experience. Oh yes, okay. This came to me many, many years ago because uh, there are all kinds of shades within the black community now. There is from Adam Clayton Powell White to Marcus Garvey Black. So uh, I, just, I just thought about this for so long and I said, well now, being black is not a matter of a color. It's an experience that you have, regardless of your color. If you're as white as Adam Clayton Powell and uh, black as Marcus Garvey, you're going to have an experience in America that is equivalent to being rejected and segregated against and discriminated against and, and uh, cheated and uh, killed. Uh, that's the experience that you will get. So it is not a color. It's an experience in this country that makes you black. Right. Because there are white people, or rather Negroes who are, who are white, skinned, but Negroes. And they get the same treatment here. So I finally said that uh, it's the experience that makes you Negro or black in America. Mm. And everyone who, uh, has, who lives here and who has one thirty-second of black blood in them, black blood, whatever that is, then uh, you are Negro. You can call yourself an African but they treat you like a Negro here, mm. without respect, without dignity. Mm. So uh, you have to say who you are and be who you are and go against the whole system of racism that this country lives on, that it created and lives on and thrives on to this very day. And they are very much worried about what you have said about where we came from and how we got out of where we were, uh, we did not deny our African heritage, of course some have, but we didn't do that, but we, uh, we realized that we were in a situation where that uh, did not mean it, that was a detriment in America. Right. So we have to move to the point where it is no longer a detriment. Yes. And uh, I just saw uh, through Brother Clemson's uh, enlightenment about the King Alfred plan. Yes. And the way he's talking is the same way that the people who are pushing the King Alfred plan say that black people or Negroes are thinking. And that kind of thinking must be destroyed according to the King Alfred plan. Right. And you are articulating it which means you are marked for death yeah. in the King Alfred plan. Yeah. And they and tried they, to kill me. Okay. And yeah, I, I, uh, they, yeah they, I, I had a serious struggle over the last, can't find work, everything. They tried to kill me, for real. Well, the Alfred plan is to kill off all blacks yes. in the country and put them, just kill them all off, get it over with, because they are not going to stop agitating for what you're saying and what I'm saying. Right. So they are preparing for that. Mm -hmm. They say these people are not going to change, so they must be eliminated. So that's what the King Alfred plan is. Kill them all off. Mm. 22 million of us. Mm. <laughs> and they stated it on uh, TV. What, what, uh, I mean, if you got that kind of plan, you don't announce it in public. But the first time I heard it, I heard it from someone on the computer. Mm. And I didn't, uh, I hadn't known about it, but wow, I can see that they do not intend to allow to happen what you're saying and what I'm saying. They will uh, kill us all off. So, 
that serious. Reverend Oliver, let me ask you to describe the black community when you were coming up in terms of businesses, in terms of uh, churches, in terms of leadership among black people, in terms of our cohesiveness or our togetherness uh, so that we can see before and after, before segregation, who ran the schools? What was education like? What were the businesses in the black community like? Kind of give us a snapshot of the black community before uh, integration and the black community today when you go to these communities. Okay. Uh, we grew up as a cohesive society, cohesive around separateness and segregation. And we understood that uh, that was where the uh, prevailing society wanted us to be. And if we wanted to be in good terms with them, we had to accept what they gave to us. So there were segregated schools. Whites went to separate schools, blacks went to separate schools. There was only one high school in Birmingham, Alabama, and that was uh, Parker oh, High. Parker High was started by A.H. Parker, who was a follower of Booker T. Washington, mm. and he set up industrial high school teaching Negroes trades, mm -hmm. how to run printing presses, how to uh, make uh, clothes, uh, how to uh, mend shoes, uh, all of the things that we need to enable us to live were taught at Parker High. And I took printing under Fess Watley. When A.H. Uh, Parker died, uh, the school's name changed from Industrial High School to Parker High School. And uh, that's where I went, that's where my uh, son went, and uh, uh, but th there was a cohesiveness, but it was a cohesiveness within the framework of segregation. You had to stay there and be happy there. That was all that the segregationists would allow. If you wanted to get out of that and break out of that, you didn't do that in the South, otherwise you were killed or lynched, uh, or you'd have to leave. And there were hundreds of thousands of Negroes who had to leave the South because they simply could not stand uh, the segregation there. But when they came north, there was a more subtle kind of segregation, which uh, still did not accept them. So wherever we go in America, we are unaccepted and unacceptable. And there is no program in this country that provides for the type of dignity that you're speaking of, sharing power, no. This country hasn't even uh, accepted that uh, they don't have all the power that they thought they had. And right now they feel that they c control all black people and everybody's got to fit in with their way of life or else they want to wipe them out and kill them. That's the white mentality that's still ruling this country. And that's the mentality that, that has to go. If we can find a way to survive together, very good. But the King Alfred plan makes it very clear that they do not have any intention ever to share power. There's no such thing as sharing power with black people in this country or in any country. So that's the racism that is still so deep in this country that so far, it cannot be erased, and it's going to come to either the King Alfred plan being uh, being uh, uh, put into effect and wiping out some 20 or 30 million black people in this country. Now, that's very silly, but you, you, you can't say that uh, they haven't warned us. They have made it very plain. And they have announced it, nigger, you're not welcome. Yeah. And that hasn't changed. Mm. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Asa, with those words that Reverend Oliver just laid out, uh, nigger, uh, we don't want you here. 
you're never, I'm summarizing, uh, you're never going to be accepted here. In fact, before we share power with you, we will exterminate you. Did integration diminish our ability or uh, our power to resist? Uh, but even the under state? integration, we had no power. We were under a totalitarian dictatorship, right? So even within segregation, we were limited. And at any time, look at places like Wall, Black Wall Street, Tulsa, Oklahoma, where we had powerful economic institutions, but we were surrounded by a sea, an ocean, a galaxies of white supremacy who had the power. Well, they dropped the first bombs on American soil to destroy this prosperous, segregated community, right? So the issue is because they had the power to do so. They had the power. And they got the okay from the ruling elite to do it. And nothing happened. Nothing happened at all. Mm -hmm. So my, my question is goes back to... Do we want to be a part of the ruling elite where we can guarantee the sanctity and survival of our genetic pool the same way that they do? Or do we not? If we don't want to be a part of the ruling elite, then extermination is the only recourse of the ruling elite because our, we're not needed anymore. They don't need our labor. Slavery is over with. They don't need us. And what do you do with a dog that's not needed anymore in the circus? Who's grown too old to even perform? You euthanize it, you get rid of it. So if we know that is the case, and we do want, we act as if we want to rule ourselves, then how do we get to the point of ruling ourselves? That, to me, is the issue. And this is these are the issues that Garvey fought for, and the black folk who, and the, the millions of black people, who they said were dumb and ignorant, because they were talking about <coughs> ruling themselves. That that's dumb and ignorant. Only people who can talk like that are European, not us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, that's what it boils down to: mm -hmm. being able to control. To make sure that our best minds are able to make sure to ensure that everybody gets a piece 